Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Ariel Gennat. I have been a lecturer here at uh, the Whiteman School of Design for uh, over a decade. Um, and over the years, I also forged some alliances, uh, strategic ones, with uh, the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilization, uh, the Department of History and Art History, and importantly, the Center for East Asian Studies, uh, who is co-sponsoring this event tonight. Um, I would like to welcome you to our lecture series on behalf of uh, our department chair, Winka Dubledum, who unfortunately is a little bit sick, so she asked me to take over this part. Um, and also to thank Winka uh, sincerely for taking on this event and uh, making this happen. Uh, and also to Professor Fred Dickinson, who is luckily in Japan today, uh, from the Center for East Asian Studies, who is the director of the, the center, and David Detman, who is with us, the associate director of the Center for East Asian Studies. Uh, in general, not just for this event, but for, in general for supporting my work over the years. Um, I would also like to send a big thank you to Michelle Saunders, who is with us and is our great event coordinator, uh, and to our facilities team, uh, Carl, Sandy, Mark, Brandon, uh, and the team. Uh, our event tonight brings together uh, three, at least, of my passions in research, in research topics, uh, architectural culture, technology, and Japan. Uh, our guests are one practicing architect uh, who has written an excellent work of research, um, architect Casey Mack, and one erudite scholar who, uh, whose research has been firmly grounded in practice, and that's uh, Dr. Ivan Rupnik. Uh, together, I think our conversation tonight would demonstrate that uh, practice and theory of architecture are mutually uh, dependent and really cannot be separated. At least that's my conviction. Um, it is uh, an honor and a pleasure to uh, introduce to you my friend Casey Mack, uh, who is uh, the founder of Popular Architecture in New York, a practice uh, combining simplicity and innovation in design across multiple scales. Uh, Casey holds a BA in Art History from Vassar College and an MArc from Columbia. Uh, he practiced with OMA, the Office of Metropolitan Architecture in Hong Kong and New York, uh, and has taught uh, in New York Institute of Technology and Parsons. And his latest book, Digesting Metabolism, which we are here to discuss tonight, was awarded the best publication in architecture for 2022 by the Zhuangzhong Books in Shanghai. Uh, Dr. Ivan Rupnik uh, has kindly agreed to join us tonight as a panelist, although I have to say uh, his work and scholarship surely deserve a panel of its own uh, in a dedicated event, hopefully in the future. Um, he is an architect, a researcher, and an associate professor at Northeastern University. Ivan's doctoral work at Harvard University focused on uh, the knowledge transfer between architecture, construction, and manufacturing that occurred in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, his scholarship uh, has looked at critically at architecture and construction practices and really builds uh, bridges between uh, academe and industry. In 2018, he co-founded ModX, uh, a research and advisory group focused on the growing offsite construction sector. ModX has provided research and consulting support um, to leading companies, NGOs, and governmental agencies in the US and abroad, including uh, the Modular, Modular Building Institute, uh, the National Institute for Building Sciences, and the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, um, he has many publications, uh, to mention some, just uh, a few. Uh, he is the author of the book, uh, Peripheral Moment, Experiments in Architectural Agency of 2010. Uh, the co-author of Project Zagreb of, 20, of 2007, and Baku, Oil and Urbanism with Yves Blau of 2015. Um, <clears throat> by way of a brief introduction to Casey's um, presentation tonight, I'd like to say just a few words uh, on what I think uh, makes the publication meaningful uh, today. Um, it is safe to say that almost every architecture history and theory course around the world uh, in the past 60 years has included a chapter or at least a paragraph uh, 
uh, on the Japanese group of architects who called themselves the metabolists in 1960. Uh, and yet, those histories have uh, almost exclusively been critical, especially as regards to the work's failure to live up to the author's intentions uh, and declarations, namely, that in post-war Japan, a new type of architecture, especially one dedicated to dwelling, um, should allow uh, change over time. Uh, they believed that would be possible using the latest advances in construction technology. Most architectural histories also agreed that by 1970, um, in the Osaka Expo, metabolism was declared dead. The title of Casey's book, Digesting Metabolism, Artificial Land in Japan, 1954-2202, suggests a move away from the narratives that have uh, considered the metabolism um, a closed chapter of history. Uh, so for those who wondered uh, the year 2202, that's not a typo in the print on the cover of the book, um, but you will have to read the book to know what that refers to. Um, uh, one notes also that um, the metabolist meal uh, in Casey's book begins six years earlier than most narratives on metabolism. It's whetting one's appetite, as it were, with Le Corbusier's idea of artificial land and the figure of his protege, Yoshizaka Takamasa, in case you're wondering who are the two figures on the cover of the book. Uh, I'm sure Casey is going to tell us a little bit more about this. And so through artificial land as a leitmotif, uh, the book brings incredibly thorough research, which Casey has conducted in Japan and abroad for over a decade, um, braving the language barriers that uh, some of us still struggle with, um, and bringing to both English and Japanese readers new insight on what many of us thought they knew too well. Before I first read Casey's manuscript, uh, I was a bit skeptical on the possibility to uncover something new about metabolism in 2022. Uh, but reading through the manuscript, I became convinced that it was about time to shake off some of our preconceptions. Uh, returning to the book's title, uh, Casey does it by expanding the time frame in which we assess the work's pertinence and includes uh, projects which have previously been overlooked um, which really turns the metabolist uh, meal from what was previously close to a bento box in the architectural histories into a banquet uh, with many diverse dishes, meticulously articulated and structured. Uh, and like a good traditional Japanese meal, the presentation and the contents of the material are one, uh, thanks to the excellent graphic design by Alice Chung, who is with us uh, tonight as well. Um, and, um, and the graphic design uh, and the, the stunning reproduction of the drawings are, and photographs uh, not only support the very rich content, um, this is a very dense um, piece of writing, uh, but it makes it extremely pleasurable to digest. Uh, another striking quality, and I will end with that, <coughs> of the book uh, is the author's skillful movement between scales of design uh, in each of the project discussed and between them. Um, the structural and methodological aspect, I think, is crucial to understanding the core contribution of metabolism, uh, metabolist ideas to world architecture in general and uh, to current practice. Uh, at the macro scale, it draws a fascinating, uh, fascinating canvas of the historical, social, and political context, but it also moves all the way to the level of the steel plate assembly detail um, of the frame structure uh, of each building. Well, some of them are concrete, uh, but um, yeah. Uh, a few architecture texts that I know of uh, have managed to do this transition so effectively. Uh, this is what makes this book, in my mind, one of, uh, if not the best written works on metabolism uh, and enables architects, students, scholars, uh, and any Japan aficionado uh, to get a balanced and sober insight into um, one of Japan's important, most important contributions to our discipline. Um, I could go on, but uh, I'd rather let the author convince you um, of uh, the material. Uh, 
Um, we will begin uh, the evening by a presentation by Casey, which will last for about 45 minutes, uh, and then move on to a conversation with Ivan Ruknik. Um, and all of this will be followed by uh, a nice reception upstairs. It's worth waiting. Uh, and there will be um, also a stand for the, if you want to get your own copy of the books uh, and even get it signed by the author who is here. So please join me in welcoming Casey Mack. So, hi everyone, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, Ariel, uh, for that introduction and, and making this happen tonight and to, to Winka for supporting it happening. And Ivan, of course, for coming tonight to uh, talk about metabolism and I think uh, housing uh, more broadly. Um, just give me a moment here to get things fired up. Um, So, yes, um, this is a book that, uh, as, as Ariel mentioned, um, took quite a long time to, to write. Um, it relies on a lot of material that was in Japanese, which is a language that I don't uh, read. Um, and so to identify things that need to be translated to tell a particular story, uh, a story at first I wasn't even aware of existing, um, took a, a very long uh, period of time. Um, I think to, to give you some, some background about how this project uh, came to be, um, I started working in Hong Kong at OMA Asia in uh, the year 2000, and my uh, boss of the office, Aaron Tan, had written his uh, thesis at the GSD on the Kowloon Walled City. Um, and the Walled City uh, was torn down by the time that I moved to Hong Kong um, in 2000, but its uh, influence was still really kind of pervasive throughout the city, and its kind of tectonics of people, say, adding floors to their building, adding their own balconies, hanging out laundry, all of this kind of uh, additive uh, architecture that was kind of open to appropriation that in various parts of Asia are fairly common, to me was something entirely new coming from New York. I was coming from 90s uh, blob era Columbia, um, where everything was about a kind of smoothing of architecture. And this kind of additive architecture uh, was something that was extremely uh, inspiring to me. Um, this is the view out of my apartment window in Hong Kong, kind of seen on a smaller scale uh, dynamics, as you see in the walled city, of people adding a, a shading device or adding a plant, etc. Very kind of banal things, but again, not what I saw whatsoever in, in New York City. So you then also had a very kind of formal architecture. This is the plaza level of uh, Norman Foster's Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, which every weekend was taken over uh, for its shade and nice uh, plaza space by the, the Filipino uh, maids. And this kind of combination of how architects could be designing something that was really open to uh, sort of indeterminate use and to addition by, say, residents or uh, occupants of the city was a kind of um, open-endedness that, that, again, was it was a kind of new um, experience for, for me. Um, and so I started to become interested in the metabolites at this time as architects who maybe had addressed this kind of attempt to combine a kind of formal design with more kind of informal uh, dynamics. And so um, I got a grant from the Graham Foundation to, to start this, this research uh, into the metabolis. And quite early on, I had the good fortune of being introduced to um, Hajime Yatsuka, who's probably the world's foremost expert in metabolism and an incredibly generous uh, scholar, um, who also introduced me to, to Ariel uh, years later. Um, and one of the distinctions that Yatsuka makes is between an archogram metabolism and a team 10 metabolism. And the, the archogram metabolism is really uh, epitomized by the Naga King capsule tower, which I'm sure you all know, uh, torn down, I think, completely as of last year. Um, and this kind of archogram metabolism is the one that I think people know much better. Like archogram, it's the one that's much more kind of sci-fi, pop, and has this kind of uh, uh, 
imagistic kind of quality that makes it really stand out in a way that, that say, Team 10 uh, epitomize in met metabolic terms by the work of, say, Masato Otaka um, isn't quite as flashy and isn't really the metabolism that's so well known. So what I'll be talking about tonight is um, really projects are kind of descending from this Team 10 side, if you will, of the Archigram family that was this side that I, I felt was not really one that had been so looked at and that really spoke to this kind of um, interest in vernaculars and interest in a kind of additive architecture uh, that was not what I felt really when I looked at the, the capsule tower. Um, so this is Masato Otaka on national television in the early 60s. Um, with a model of his uh, Sakaide artificial land platform. Uh, and, you know, this term artificial land, when I first heard it, seemed kind of like this very awkward term, maybe like a kind of just synonym for megastructure. Uh, but then I came across this project from the early 90s, uh, Next 21 in Osaka, which um, some of you may know. Um, and in the official brochure for the project from its client, Osaka Gas, who's basically like the, the Con Edison um, of, of Osaka, uh, it was described as artificial land. So you kind of have this awkward term appearing between 1960 and then suddenly in the 1990s. And I then became aware of this connection back to uh, the work of Le Corbusier, who, who coined the term uh, in the uh, early 30s for his project in, in Algiers, the Fort L'Imperior project. And I'm sure many of you or all of you know this, this drawing, um, which is really, I think, in the top you know, five of most famous architectural drawings of, of modernism. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's a little bit um, uh, kind of contradictory. Let's see if we can get this pointer to work. Um, whoops. There, I think I'm turned off your pointer. Um, it's a little bit contradictory in that um, really at the time, you, you have um, this European obsession with standardizing housing. And here you have a project that's by one of the architects who's participating in that, that pursuit through, say, Siam and the minimum dwelling being the pursuits of many architects, who's making a, a housing project where uh, the building is, is conceived um, really as a, I don't know why I'm, sorry, having trouble with this. Ariel, if you could, I'm sorry, but I'm, oh, sorry, upside down. I need my IT consultants. Um, so yeah, so each one of the, the uh, four slabs here was actually not called a four slab, but was referred to as artificial land. And so the idea was that the city would build this infrastructure of artificial land on which residents or residents-to-be would buy as much land as they wanted to then buy or, or build a house that would be designed by their own architect. And this would be the way that the city could, through kind of minimal infrastructural investment, relatively speaking, have new housing, but also fund the development of new infrastructure for the city. So it was this kind of economic uh, idea, really, as well as an architectural one. And so um, you then come to uh, a project like Kenzo Tange's uh, 1960 plan, um, you know, probably the most famous uh, unbuilt uh, metabolist, shall we say, uh, project. And this quote from um, Peter Smithson, uh, which I came across early on, who of course is one of the main Team 10 architects, became really a provocation to the conceptualization of the whole book. And so Smithson writes, unhappily as in the thousand student projects from the time of Le Corbusier's Algiers projects onwards, the romance of the idea of each man building his own house on man-made platforms stands unsupported by a demonstration of how it is to be done. And so, you know, having seen Next 21, having seen Sakaide, uh, I started to wonder or think really this, this is not <laughs> really a, a true statement um, and that really what the book could be uh, conceptualized as um, could be an a investigation of what are these built examples. So one of the kind of uh, rules for me for the book became that I could only look at built work. Things had to be built projects and they all had to be projects that, that I, I visited. Um, so this is zooming in to uh, Tange's uh, housing for the 1960 plan. And so you can see this kind of tent-like form. I'm sure this is probably a familiar um, 
section to some degree as well. And if you really zoom in, you can see this kind of fringe here of housing built to individual taste. This, so this kind of realization of artificial land or a proposal of it um, as, as a kind of fundamental part of one of the most famous proposals in metabolism. So there's this kind of fundamental uh, uh, importance of artificial land to um, metabolism I was realizing. Uh, and so there were a number of things that I realized as well that I want to work against in the writing of the book or, or try to um, counter. Um, one uh, is that megastructures and artificial land are the same thing. I would say that they're basically have a kind of a Venn diagram relationship. They overlap to a high degree often, but they are not reducible to each other. Uh, another was this sort of perception in a lot of at least English language uh, history of Japanese post-war architecture where you kind of jump from Hiroshima 1945 to all of a sudden the 1960 plan. And so I had this, this curiosity, well, what really happened in those intervening 15 years? Surely there was architecture that happened in between, and what was it? And so I had this interest in really kind of looking into that, that period between uh, those two times. Um, another thing to really work uh, against, I felt, was just this total dominance of the perception of housing in Japan by the house. And there is almost no book that you can find that is about housing in Japan. Now, if you look at houses, <laughs> there's any number. And so, you know, I think what's really important is if you get into uh, post war housing in Japan, is that you realize how much criticism there's been of the single family house as a type. And not only that there's been this criticism, but also a tremendous amount of work that is multifamily that, that paints a very different kind of picture. So this was another kind of, uh, uh, kind of dominant narrative that I wanted to try to uh, counter. Um, so um, this was another kind of organizing idea for the book, um, which is a, a long tail diagram. Um, a long tail uh, uh, is about really um, trying to move away from dominance by greatest hits, Nankin Capsule Tower, a plan for Tokyo, Expo 70, uh, Sky House, and to instead look at how the tail, you know, this is something that was as a term invented in discussing Amazon and Netflix, that actually the tail of the smaller hits, the B-sides, actually do much more of the heavy lifting uh, and, and uh, sort of realization, say, in architecture of, of concepts than the greatest hits. So with these uh, uh, kind of concepts, um, I started to um, often um, with, with my, my wife and sometimes my daughter um, visiting uh, various cities um, in Japan, mostly on Honshu, but definitely not exclusively to Tokyo. A number of, um, I would say, kind of second tier cities that really show a very kind of different side of Japan. Uh, this is me as, as amateur architectural detective in, in Osaka. Um, and so I'd like to um, jump into just three projects uh, that I'd like to talk about that I think give um, a sort of lay of the land, um, if you will, of how artificial land has been interpreted in, in Japan. Um, artificial land, I think, is very important to uh, be thought of through um, two main kind of concepts that I have in the book. Uh, one is the idea of the, the maximum dwelling, um, and the other is, is that of um, the transitional type. And so these two um, interpretations are ones that I'll, I'll be talking about in the, the following three projects. So um, first project I'd like to talk about is the house for Takamasa Yoshizaka. Uh, he is on the cover of the book with Le Corbusier, pre-goatee. Pre um, he is not an architect who's very well known outside of Japan. Um, he's one of the three uh, most well-known architects who work with Le Corbusier, the other two, Junzo Sakakura and Kunio Meikawa, being much, well, uh, much more known um, in the West. Uh, I think if Yoshizaka is known here, he's probably best known for his Japanese pavilion. Um, in Venice, part of the, the Biennale grounds. Uh, this is his inter-university seminar house from 1964, just outside of Tokyo. And Yoshizaka is really an, an incredible architect who I think happily, I mean, beyond my book, I think is having a bit of a, of a renaissance, certainly in uh, Japan right now. Um, so I mentioned that, that in between period of between 1945 and 1960. So to uh, get into the, the ashes quite, quite literally, in 1945, 
Uh, Yoji Zaka returns from military service. He was stationed in, in um, Korea in the military. Um, he returns to Shinjuku uh, in Tokyo, and he moves on to the site of his burned down childhood home. Um, and on that site, he builds this uh, barrack here, barrack being the typical term in Japan for post-disaster housing, and is joined by four friends who build their own barracks. And these, these, these barracks are really almost just pieces of furniture with a roof put over them, just extremely primitive. And this was a, a time in Japan that is called by the metabolist, uh, pardon me, historian, uh, Noboru Kawazoe, the era of self-construction. And at the time, the country was entirely broke, and really there was a vast uh, realization of dwellings, uh, if you can call them that, that were all self-built by residents or with the help of local carpenters, but really a completely improvised, bottom-up uh, production of, of housing through whatever means were, were available. Um, so I think what's really important is that this had happened before in Tokyo. So these are sketches by Wajiro Khan. Wajiro Khan uh, was one of Yoshizaka's professors at Waseda University, where he graduated from uh, architecture school. And Khan was, um, he's kind of called by some the, the Walter Benjamin of, of Japan, um, but just a much better drawer, at least. And Khan, after the, the great Kanto earthquake of 1923, uh, went around the city and made all these drawings as well as photographs of the different shelters that people had made after their houses had been destroyed to try to uh, give themselves some, some protection until uh, better times arrived. And, and Khan was really fascinated by the kinds of improvisations that people made with found materials to produce shelter. And this sort of survey work was part of a larger project that Khan did with his students, including Yoshizaka, in uh, surveying um, vernacular houses or, or Minka folk houses as they're known uh, around Japan and also in Manchuria and other areas of Asia. And really this kind of survey work was fascinated with these kind of like really subjective kind of modifications of space where you have this sort of cabin where um, this resident has sort of popped out shelving through the window to kind of expand the small area of his, his shelter to store his canteen and other things. And these sort of modifications of space that were left, left up to users was something that was of, of tremendous interest to Khan as well as to, to Yoshizaka. Um, and again, really something very much counter to the kind of fixation with minimum dwellings as was so prominent in, in Europe. Um, so. Uh, Yoshizaka kind of felt that, that to pursue this interest in, in housing, he should go work with Le Corbusier. So in 1950, he goes to Paris. Uh, he works for two weeks on the construction site of the Unité d'Habitation Marseille. Um, you can see um, in one of the official diagrams here that even though it's now uh, 1950, uh, train artificiel or artificial land is still a term that Corbusier is using well after 1931 to describe this part of the Unité. Um, this part now is an infrastructural plenum. It's where all the MEP systems for the building are gathered. But if you get into the structure of the building, and you know, bear in mind that this is the construction site that Yoshizaka is spending his days on, you can see that before the famous interlocking units are inserted, that you have this artificial land structure that's actually even a kind of more uh, bold version of a section through the Fort L'Imperior project in Algiers here, where artificial land was born, that really the unité is the same structure, but actually even a more kind of bold version with instead of a duplex allowing the insertion of mezzanines, you now have a kind of triplex structure allowing even, it would seem, a potentially greater freedom in how it could be uh, inhabited. Uh, so um, it's, I think, really important to, to know uh, that this origin of artificial land um, I mean, this is a surmise of mine, but I think it's, it's, it's very <laughs> probably safe to say, uh, comes from publications such as The Concrete House and Construction from 1912 by Maurice Sloan, which we know was in uh, Le Corbusier's library. And um, concrete, or actually Portland cement, was patented in 1824 
under the name of artificial stone. And by the time of the early 1900s in American publications, concrete in general is referred to as artificial stone. And so I think it's quite a short leap, um, at least if you're a genius like Corbusier, to go from artificial stone to artificial land and really to start to interpret a foreplate not as merely a foreplate, but to start to see the foreplate in terms of the kinds of issues raised by land, that now the foreplate is about property, ownership, subdivision, control. And these are exactly the kinds of issues that Dr. Bouzier and then later Yoshizaka brings to what might seem to be a very generic frame simply by calling it artificial land. Yoshizaka on the building site here, nicely slotted into the perspective with his friends. So he returns to uh, Japan in 1952, um, and in 1954, he writes an article for a prominent journal where he, he launches his idea of artificial land as a way to address uh, Japan's housing crisis. At the time, the country had about a shortage of 4.2 million houses, um, and he writes uh, in the journal, it is not necessary to make all the fine details of the home with our current budget for public housing. What we need to do is make land. This land, however, does not need to be earth. A land that can provide the electricity, gas, water supply, and sewage required for modern technology could be a land made of concrete. We should make land that is suitable for housing and that can be made effective use of what little city space we have by being able to be layered. We do not need to do any more than this. And I think what's really important is that Yoshizaka really didn't want to do any more than this because he wanted artificial land to be a kind of infrastructure for the kind of subjectivity, the kind of personal uh, adaptations and changes that he had seen in his studies of folk housing with Kong uh, back in the, the uh, early 40s. And again, really working against these kinds of models that were becoming very important in Japan at the time, um, this here, um, is uh, two plans, um, one bad, one good, from the Berlin architect Alexander Klein, uh, promoting a kind of minimum dwelling uh, concept where you should really be avoiding friction in the organization of the apartment, and that that was something that would lead to a more harmonious household. This kind of idea was very influential on the 2DK uh, apartment that was uh, very heavily inspired by the architect Utsu Nishiyama, who was a close follower of Alexander Klein. And the 2DK uh, really became like the minimum dwelling of Japan that was built by many thousands uh, between the mid 50s and the early 1970s. Um, and just was this initially wildly successful thing, but also wasn't a thing that you had too much choice about if you were going to move into uh, new, newly produced housing. Um, its basic idea was two tatami mat rooms, uh, and then the DK being a combined dining kitchen on a wood floor, combining a kind of traditional Japanese uh, uh, arrangement with something that was more Western, so kind of a fusion being created in this, this uh, new apartment type. Um, but again, this was not what Yoshizaka wanted. So Yoshizaka realizes that he needs to start to um, try to prove his, his idea in practice. So he builds a frame of artificial land uh, using salvaged US Army lumber to build the formwork. Uh, for about a year, he saves up funds until he's able to afford to infill it with concrete blocks and, and inexpensive windows with the help of his students from Waseda. So it is largely a, a uh, self-build uh, project. And you can see uh, these interiors here. Um, this is uh, the, the second floor um, that has the main entry, uh, kitchen and living dining area, definitely a, a uh, far from frictionless space. And then in 1955, uh, Le Corbusier comes to uh, visit Japan for his, his, his first and only visit. Uh, he comes to visit, or, I'm sorry, comes to visit Yoshizaka's house um, and says to Yoshizaka, only you could live here. And you could see this as perhaps an insult, but I think that really, in a way, uh, for Yoshizaka, this was the highest compliment, that really his house fit him like the shell of a creature, and that that kind of fit between his lifestyle and his house was exactly what he had been after. Um, I want to say here that lifestyle is a term that appears a lot in writings about Japan and in uh, things that architects will say about their architecture. And I think lifestyle in the West, I feel like, is something that seems completely um, uh, kind of uh, co-opted by luxury. And that in Japan, it has a much more kind of open um, 
uh, usage that really is about a kind of plurality of, of ways of living. And it's certainly something very important in Yoshizaka's uh, thinking. Um, you can see here this incredible uh, section drawn by his younger son uh, in 1972. Uh, this is the Yoshizaka family gathered here. Uh, Yoshizaka's wife, Yoshizaka, um, I believe, oh, his son, who I think drew the section, his daughter, his oldest son, and his son's wife. Um, and so artificial land can, in Yoshizaka's later work, start to seem a little bit um, absent or kind of murky. It doesn't seem so strong as an influence any longer. But I think uh, it was something that really had, had um, infected Yoshizaka's thinking. And at some point, the house was leaking so terribly that his wife couldn't stand it any longer and said, you have to fix this leak. And he says, no problem. I'll just add another floor to the house. And this was really this kind of demonstration of the artificial land idea that you can fix a leak by simply adding another floor. Um, so really, I think you still had this kind of freedom in mind uh, in his thinking at, at quite a late date. It seems that first, ADEC did not quite solve the problem here in 1980. It's gotten even bigger. Uh, and this is the house just before being torn down in 1981. Yoshizaka died quite young at the age of 63 uh, in, 19, in 1980. Um, so uh, I'd like to just very quickly uh, talk about metabolism itself. Yoshizaka was not a metabolist, but you get to the World Design Conference, which these black and white photos are from here. The World Design Conference was in Tokyo in 1960. Uh, it was where metabolism made its debut. Um, they invited all kinds of uh, Western luminaries, the architects that the Japanese metabolists wanted to be in competition with. You can see Paul Rudolph, uh, Liu Khan, uh, um, Minoru Yamasaki here, uh, Jane Drew. Um, and various others, um, here Kenzo Tange, uh, Kiso Kurokawa, and, and many others. The Smithsons attended as well, Allison Peter Smithson. And so um, at the conference, uh, you know, where metabolism had really been kind of engineered as a debut of a, a, a Japanese avant-garde, uh, you had Kenzo Tange give the keynote speech. He, he talked about the importance of how architecture can and urbanism can combine uh, long-lived and short-lived structures. And this kind of challenge of recognizing that the world was becoming increasingly driven by large-scale infrastructures that had incredibly long lifespans, but then also new levels of consumerism that were about things that were more rapidly uh, going obsolete, it seemed to be the main architectural challenge on how to combine these two different timescales. Uh, and so I would say that, that that kind of combination of tectonics is really one that comes directly from the influence of artificial land. Uh, this was a project that uh, Kenzo Tange did with his students at MIT that is completely an artificial land project. Uh, this was actually proposed for, for Boston Harbor. Um, but while that kind of combination of long-lived and short-lived uh, is quite well known um, as the kind of mind-numbing core idea, as Rainer Banham described it, of metabolism, um, I'd like to very quickly talk about another side of it that was really um, part of the thinking, at least, of Noboru Kawazoe, who was um, metabolism's operative critic. He is an incredibly important uh, architectural historian. He had written for uh, Shinken Chiku, one of the main um, Japanese architectural magazines, better known here as, as JA. Um, and Kawazoe was um, a, a lifelong reader of uh, Karl Marx's Capital. And um, Marx talks extensively in Capital about metabolism and really uh, sees metabolism as no longer an exclusively biological phenomenon, but one that has become increasingly social. And so what's important about Marx, and I think also for a definition of metabolism in general, is that you're now talking about a concept that is no longer strictly biological, but is really very social as well. Um, and so to, to illustrate that, um, Marx was really obsessed with uh, the chemist, Justice von Liebig, who was very uh, concerned about the separation of countryside and city. And that, that separation uh, in the context of London had led to no longer sewage from urban dwellers eating farmers' products going back to the country, but instead being dumped into the Thames and leading to terrible pollution. So uh, von Liebig, who uh, uh, Marx is reading, is talking about this kind of broken metabolic cycle. This metabolic rift, as it's become known, um, was something that, that needed to be repaired. 
uh, in Kawazoe's thinking. Um, and it wasn't that Kawazoe had to look to London to kind of find this kind of uh, metabolic rift. Uh, in Japan in the early 60s, even as of the late uh, 1950s, you had terrible industrial pollution. Uh, this is in the city of Yokaichi here, an image that looks very familiar to us today with the, the masks, where because of the lack of zoning in Japan, uh, you would have oil refineries, for example, built right next to housing projects leading to terrible instances and deaths from, from asthma. And this was a huge problem in Japan at the time. Um, and so really, you know, this is a kind of context that, that to Kawazoe is very uh, near to home and really not something simply from, from the time of, of, of Marx. Uh, and I think, you know, Kawazoe writes as well about this project by Masato Otaka, uh, where housing should not be built on land reclamation, but instead should be built on piers, allowing water to flow underneath, that you see metabolisms where we in architecture this concern with these kind of natural flows. Certainly it's not something that always did very well at all, so I'm not trying to make an apology for it, but that I think in this aspect of metabolism that I'm writing about, I think you see these, these strains more strongly than, than has typically been uh, presented. Um, so um, the Yoshizaka house is really this idea of the, the maximum dwelling, really as this kind of counter to the minimum dwelling that was so dominant as an ideology and actually a built reality, both in Europe and in, in Japan. Um, the other type I'd like to talk about, a type of interpretation of artificial land, uh, is the transitional type, um, which I'll, I'll talk about through uh, the Motomachi apartments. Now, the Motomachi apartments, um, I should say, all the dates in my book are when design started. So 1968 is when Masato Otaka, uh, one of the official metabolists, um, started design. Um, and Motomachi uh, was first uh, opened in 1972, uh, the same year as the Nagakin Capsule Tower. And I think what's really incredible is how much uh, journalistic space and server space with photos is devoted to uh, the Nagakin Capsule Tower and its failure when you have a project like Motomachi Apartments, which actually does not even appear once in all of Project Japan. So, you know, you can kind of see why to some degree if you look really kind of superficially. It looks perhaps like a lot of European housing projects uh, from the post-war period. Um, but as we get into it, you'll see that it's actually something entirely unique. Um, so this is the hypocenter of the American atom bomb detonation in August 1945. The Muramachi apartments is later built here. Uh, in an area that was immediately destroyed by the firestorm. Um, and what I think is very important to realize while we think about all of the kind of neon and, and kind of glam of 1970s Japan or even 1960s Japan, you know, Expo 70 and so on, is that into, into the 1970s, you had a part of Hiroshima that was known as the atomic slum, where you had over 3,000 households, mostly of A-bomb victims, mostly who were Korean, who had been brought to Japan as slave labor, living into the 1970s. And so these are our photos from 1972 of the atomic slum taken by an American who was working for Mitsubishi, um, I believe, at the time. Um, and you can see here Motomachi going up behind them. I think you'll now quickly see the kind of artificial land structure here with the same kind of duplex voids uh, going up behind the atomic slum and all of the residents um, were uh, slowly rehoused in, in the new housing. So you can see this uh, figure ground plan here of uh, the atomic slum, which had grown in around some um, emergency housing built by the government. And then the way that densification of Otaka's project um, cleared the site for a really vast new uh, public park. Um, you can see down here uh, the well-known um, A-bomb dome. And the A-bomb dome, um, I'm sure you all know, uh, is really part of this memorial axis established by Kenzo Tange. So Kenzo Tange in 1955 designs um, the Peace Memorial Museum right here. This is actually uh, south, this is north in this drawing. So, you know, the Peace Memorial Museum is quite well known. Uh, what is not so well known um, really at all outside of Japan, I, I think it's safe to say, is how Otaka's project actually continues this kind of memorial axis. Metabolism is not a project or, or a movement rather that's known for its engagement of history and memory and especially tragedy in, in a kind of symbolic way. 
Um, and really, Muramachi uh, very much kind of counters that, that uh, interpretation. Um, so you have you know, a famous photo like this, I think by uh, Yukio Futagawa, you know, where you have the Peace Memorial Museum and the A-Bomb Dome there, you know, which Tange very um, uh, kind of astutely makes this alignment with. Uh, but then you can see here the Memorial Museum, uh, the dome here, and how that really passes that memorial access line right through the middle of the Momotomachi housing. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is looking down that memorial axis. Uh, and Otaka really plays into this kind of thematization of view by making a roofscape that's entirely open to the public. That's this, this sky garden, another kind of artificial land that you can see here. Um, it's now closed to the public, unfortunately, only open to, to the residents. But really, the project like, is just in its basic uh, concept, really engaging this kind of memorial uh, aspect of, of the city. Um, so now, I think to, to move to the kind of transitional concept I mentioned, um, this is moving down into one of the uh, so-called streets in the sky. You can see some of the uh, primary structure here. Um, this was actually called major structure, not mega structure, but major structure by the engineer for the project. Um, again, as you saw before, you can see it here on the, the uh, facade. Um, this was the first steel high-rise building in Japan. Um, the steel was all prefabricated, of course, I mean, as you would expect, but prefabricated off-site. Uh, but what's, what's really important about that prefabrication um, is that it was all done by uh, the naval shipyard in Kure that had built the battleship Yamato, which was the lead battleship of the Imperial Japanese Navy, the largest battleship in World War II. And so you have the steel techniques that were used for producing that battleship that was kind of you know the pinnacle of, of Imperial Japan being repurposed to actually make the steel for this project kind of bookends that Imperial Japan by really kind of symbolically uh, uh, indicating it, 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 its demise. Um, this is a, a drawing uh, by Masato Otaka. You can see in the, the title block here, PAU or, or POW. Uh, PAU was the, the methodology uh, or kind of philosophy of Otaka's office. Um, it stands for Prefabrication, Architecture, and Urbanism. Um, I love how kind of like <laughs> straightforward it is and, and utterly kind of um, tectonic as a philosophy. And in every one of his drawing sheets, he would um, make a larger point size, whatever one of the POW letters that drawing was about. So of course, this is a drawing clearly about architecture. Um, and I think what's really important, um, speaking metabolically, is that um, modular planning was extremely important for Otaka, and you cannot say that for all the metabolists. So this is a um, half a shaku grid. It's about three feet by three feet. Um, and this was a traditional wood module. And so I think what's really fascinating um, and very important for later projects is that even though Yoshi's, I'm sorry, Otaka is working with a very modern steel structure, he's using a dimensioning system related to wood construction. And this wasn't just kind of a historical homage, but was really about trying to integrate with still existing trades working in wood that would be making the infill for his, his building. So I think there's kind of this incredible use of, of traditional uh, modular systems in a very kind of modern uh, setting. Um, and so returning to uh, the Yamato. This is a, a frame here from the Yamato's hull. Uh, and in the hull design, you have these ribs uh, that will all be built up out of different uh, thicknesses of steel plate, uh, depending on requirements for armament or, or uh, stresses in the hull. And these pieces of the hull all had a uniform exterior dimension. And so that same uh, system was used for making all of the columns for the nine by nine uh, grid of Motomachi. And so you have this kind of continuous, uh, uh, consistent exterior dimension with different plate sizes inside, depending on the, the, the window loading and seismic loading inside of uh, the different towers. You know, they can look a little bit chaotic in this site plan, but you, you zoom in and you can see all the units are very smartly oriented, either, either southeast or southwest for good uh, solar access and also uh, cross ventilation. Um, and I think to, to return to the idea of the transitional type, which I mentioned, uh, really this project was not about the maximum dwelling. The units were completely standardized when this building was designed. They were all very rigorously either 
um, a, a 2DK or actually what was called a 3K on the, the B level. So completely standardized. But the idea was that this kind of artificial land structure or major structure, as it was called by the engineer, would allow a transition over time from Japan's relative uh, uh, austerity after the war or even into the 70s, especially for people in the atomic slum, to a condition of greater uh, uh, affluence. So the transitional type wasn't about this kind of immediate embrace of artificial lands sort of freedoms, but really as a way to allow for future adaptation and change as the fortunes of people in the nation changed. Um, and indeed, um, you can see uh, the frame here prior to fireproofing. Indeed, uh, in the year 2000, uh, the Hiroshima Housing Authority, the operator, owner and operator of Motomachi, started a 22-year-long renovation of the entire building, so just completed last year. And it's amazing, I mean, again, to think that 2,700 apartments in this building were enlarged over the last 22 years, and not a single article has appeared in Arc Daily or Architects newspaper about this kind of metabolic uh, success. Um, and I think what's really, really incredible here too is that this isn't about this kind of sprawl, but that really what you have are larger apartments but actually fewer residents. And so that Japan does have a situation of a declining population and that while apartments have enlarged, the population has, has shrunk. So you can see the original sizes here and the different unit sizes they've grown to, to here. Um, so I think what's really amazing about um, Otaka's project is that while um, uh, Tange had really made kind of museum to, to uh, the dead, uh, that really, really uh, Otaka has made a, a housing project for the living that, that were about really the survivors of that project. Um, and that, that, that today you really see this project as kind of both a monument to transformation, but also it's really kind of its performance. So this is one of the units that's recently been, been renovated. You can see you know, very traditional interior. Um, last project which I'll talk about very quickly um, is the Tsunane Apartments uh, in Nara. Uh, this is a project that really um, returns us to, um, I think, the kind of scale of Yoshizaka's uh, original proposal. Um, so it is really an example of, of, I would, as I call in the book, the maximum uh, dwelling. Um, it's a, a co-housing project uh, that was um, completed in 2000. Um, it's a, a building, um, I don't know if it's actually the wrong side of the tracks, but it was, it was the, the inexpensive side of the tracks. And so a bunch of um, friends in Nara uh, were unable to find property that they could afford, um, eventually realizing that they, if they pooled their resources, they could buy uh, this property. And with 23 families involved, would be able to build their own uh, housing project with the, the help of an architect. So again, um, you know, this was not something that was entirely, you know, about self-build, but, but really about a kind of combination of bottom-up, but also a reliance on, on formal architectural skills. Um, at the time, uh, cooperative housing was actually quite a big thing in Osaka, which you may know is, is nearby to, to Nara. Um, these are three projects um, postmodern in the best way um, that were done by the office HEXA uh, beginning in the late 1970s into the 80s. They built about a dozen of these uh, housing projects. And HEXA became so uh, popular with people wanting to build these cooperatives, uh, they actually formed a, a kind of side branch of the office called the Association of People Who Wish to Build Their Own Urban Apartment Buildings with Their Own Hands. And so this association you know, has built a dozen or so of these uh, co-ops. Um, and one of the things that, that the, the uh, head architect um, of HEXA, who actually studied with Charles Moore at, at Yale, um, is that they found packing really diverse unit types into a single envelope to be very difficult. And really what I think you see in, in uh, Tsunane is this use of artificial land research that had happened over the 70s and 80s uh, to try to make the creation of a co-op and its kind of diverse uh, uh, residents' apartment desires much easier. So one of the things in that project I showed at the beginning, Next 21, uh, that started to be introduced um, 
in the 70s, but then increasingly in the 90s. And now, if you look at Japanese housing, you know, like a current issue of Japan Architect, you'll see almost all the housing projects have raised floors, which is this kind of fascinating um, technology transfer from um, office design, where you have them used for data floors for, or for HVAC, MEP, um, and migrating raised floors to a residential condition means that you no longer have to be stacking your kitchens and bathrooms, but instead you can have a kitchen or bathroom located pretty much anywhere you want inside of your apartment building. And this has become something that has made the design of diverse units just far easier. Um, this is a schematic section of Tsunane here. I love how this is just this kind of like just wild version of the, the domino house section with these kinds of undulations being about accommodation of, of services, which you can see in the section here. You know, you can have your bathtub right against the, the uh, perimeter or push to the side. These are these gutters which cr collect rainwater for their, their great water system. Um, and so really, uh, you know, you can see that the way that the skeleton, um, as it's often called in Japan, is really of artificial land, is being used to enable this kind of uh, flexibility of infill going all the way back to Corbusier and, of course, Yoshizaka's uh, uh, desires around the maximum dwelling. Um, here, uh, floor plans of the units. Um, you know, these are fairly modest apartments. I mean, obviously much bigger than, say, the 40 square meter um, 2DK of the post-war period, which, of course, at this time was completely outdated. Um, but I think what's really wonderful is you start to see that, you know, this person wants to have a courtyard condition, this person wants to have three balconies, this person here actually built a tiny, tiny balcony off their kitchen, which is just for a hibachi. Um, and so you have these kinds of adaptations to individual subjectivities that, again, are exactly what, what had been this kind of fascination, I think, back in the, the 40s and in the, in the 50s, using this artificial land uh, structure. Um, I think what, what is interesting just in the history of artificial land, of course, megastructure is the most well-known example, is the propensity of architects to give artificial land their own name. Um, so the architect here, Toshiaki Ban, uh, calls these not artificial land, but actually stages, stages on which the residents are able to perform their own individual uh, lifestyles. Um, so uh, residents own the exterior of their apartments. The infrastructure of the slabs are collectively owned, as well as the energy systems. They established the residence with the architect, a palette of 16 materials that they could choose from for whatever uh, type of siding they wanted or types of windows or doors. So there's this kind of bracketed um, range of freedom. Um, and I think what's really beautiful about this project is the way that it starts to really express artificial land or this kind of residential uh, kind of uh, freedom um, so beautifully through making the slab so expressed, but then these columns, which are actually structural, they're extremely slender, that really make the kind of variation of the apartments uh, come out much more strongly, unlike some of the kind of earlier gridirons that you see in, say, Motomachi. So you can see on the perimeter, this is actually a solid steel column, um, just taking dead load. Uh, the columns on the interior here are what take seismic load. And so I think really what's beautiful is, is this, just this kind of tectonic uh, sort of treatment of, of this kind of flexibility um, that just is very uh, architecturally uh, sophisticated. Um, here, um, rainwater cistern uh, being fed by those gutters, one of the, the big uh, uh, balconies for one of the residents. Um, and um, this is a shared uh, community uh, meeting space kitchen um, for all of the residents. Uh, this is one of their gatherings uh, for some uh, celebration and major kind of milestone. This is Toshiaki Ban, uh, an architect who he specializes in uh, cooperative housing architecture in Japan. Uh, this is the, the uh, groundbreaking ceremony here. And I think what's really um, wonderful with the Tsunami project is, is that you had this statement by Peter Smithson of wondering how, how each man will build his own house on a platform of artificial land. And I think that you can see that Smithson's phrasing is both quite a bit dated, um, but also is really quite lonely. And that really artificial land in its fullest expression really needs the kind of collective effort that you see in, in a cooperative such as Tsunami. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. This was fascinating.
Uh, and this is only the, the tip of the iceberg. If you really look into the book, there is a lot more in it. Imagine there are uh, eight more projects in the book that are discussed in at least as much depth uh, and very well documented also. It's just also a beautiful uh, a document to, to have. Um, I, maybe to give you a few minutes to catch your breath, we'll start <laughs> with... Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> ...with Ivan Rupnik. Um, I, I, so, Ivan, you've done uh, quite a lot of work on, um, on off-site construction, uh, and you're very much involved... Well, on one hand, you did write about the, the, the beginning of the 20th century, mm -hmm. so, uh, and at the same time, now you're working with really with industry um, and consulting to government agencies. Um, and this comes sort of in the middle between mm -hmm. the two periods that you dealt with, right? Uh, so I'm wondering uh, if you could say just a few words on one hand uh, where you're, you're coming from mm -hmm. and how this, um, this document um, kind of maybe brought some new insight um, about things that you've dealt with for a long time. Yeah, well, first of all, it's a really excellent book, and I'm so pleased to be here. Uh, and, and I really find a sympathetic soul in cases like research methodology and also background. Um, so anyway, it's just really great to be having a discussion about this work. Uh, I think it's very fruitful as content, but as methodology as well. Um, and so it's also very satisfying because it links some of my schizophrenic sides. Uh, and my lack of Japanese uh, knowledge in terms of language and my also obsession with, with this place. Um, so maybe, yeah, stepping back, I mean, my, my dissertation work was looking at kind of these early attempts at the translation of standardization from industry to architectural design practice. Um, and it's interesting because um, actually what, what really reminded me of this, I organized a conference in around Team 10. Team 10 happened to have been formed around CM10, which happened to have occurred in my home country of Croatia in 1956. And it reminded me of a debate that was had between Peter Smithson, who was young at the time, and Ernst Mai. And Peter Smithson came to him and tried to explain to him the history of modernism, uh, sort of like an Alexander Klein, very clean, minimal lines, uh, absent from history. And Ernst Mai looked at him and said, what the hell are you talking about? We've been interested in popular architecture from day one, man, <laughs> to, to paraphrase that conversation. And this reminds me that this is what this work reminds me of that. And I think we have projected a history on quote unquote European modernism from the Anglo-American side, which is just not true. Mm -hmm. It's actually not historically relevant. Like research like this has not even been done on someone like Ernst Mai, who mm -hmm. we study, and who, if you looked at, did self-build, was interested in um, vernacular, worked with prefab systems, but also was interested in flexibility. So I think, you know, we've, um, we're just scratching the surface, and looking at Japan at this time is a good way to also re-examine, quote unquote, whatever the heck the canon is. Um, mm -hmm. And that has a lot to do with this idea that seems to be that we get frustrated that avant-garde's uh, don't have an impact, or maybe we don't want him to, I think. Because mm -hmm. if you look at it, the, the evidence is metabolism, and I, I can talk about this like in the work today with industry. Metabolism, whether it was influential or whether it was good at reading trends that were influential, that's something to be discussed. I don't want to give too much credit to you know, a group of fairly isolated authors. But metabolism was quite successful, and I think we have a lens in architectural theory and history to happily look for the failures of kind of avant groups, as if an avant-garde group shouldn't have the quote unquote army, like the scouts that the term comes from, following it, but that it's actually more successful if those ideas are not actually followed. And in Japan, these ideas have been really influential, whether they came from the metabolists or whether the metabolists identified certain cultural, certain technological changes that happened and that uh, are more radical than what we know. I think the, the relationship of the capsule tower uh, compared to the, the kind of artificial land project is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, yeah. And I can talk more about that, but there is there is a lot going on in Japanese industry today that we just, we don't seem to be interested in as architects or artificial historians because it doesn't follow a trope we've built for ourselves mm. uh, to engage with the world and the history of the world. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So building on this, uh, <laughs> What were, do you think, or what are today, maybe those conditions uh, about the Japanese, um, I don't want to say heritage, but um, 
the conditions of the building industry and uh, the way people think about dwelling that are perhaps particular to Japan and enabled certain the development of certain uh, kinds of uh, off-site construction, but also different thinking about dwelling. And perhaps, you know, we can, Ivan, we'll, we can start and maybe you have sure. a different... Yeah. I mean, my, I mean, page 202, <laughs> if you want to turn. Uh, Katsuh Katsuhiko Ono is a character in the story that shows up in your graph, but that I've been studying also because actually he's probably one of the most successful architects in the history of the world. He is, he designed a system, he's re remotely related to metabolists, not a metabolist, but is interesting in his ideas and wrote a dissertation, an architectural dissertation in 1968 that has directly and indirectly influenced 500,000 dwellings, all of which have a different floor plan and which we could say were designed by him. So that's a crazy idea. That's crazier to me than the, than the capsule tower, which is a beautiful building, but after a while it gets a little dull. Um, why is that, why was he so successful? Um, you know, partially timing, a chemical company wanted to diversify into the building trades in the 70s at a time when Japan was growing. But his ideas, his metabolist ideas, are influential now because Japan is a shrinking population, because Japan is an island with a closed kind of ecology in terms of materials. Mm -hmm. And his buildings, for example, are truly metabolizing. That company makes 20% of its profits from literally changing, transforming, adapting. 500,000 500, dwellings that they've tracked because they have been before Revit existed uh, mm -hmm. because Japanese are very sophisticated in many ways uh, and are able to do on a daily basis what I would call metabolism um, because of yeah. conditions that, are, that we're all dealing with. Uh, we just found out China's population is not growing. Japan is at the avant-garde of living in a no-growth uh, uh, context. Uh, ono, for example, designed a system on, with, with metabolist ideas. This company was building these houses because of demand and now has found really a profit motive to metabolize them. So this is happening in Japan. Um, and truth is stranger than fiction in some of these situations. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think um, that's totally true. I mean, I think with the capsule tower, I've always felt frustrated exactly around, oh no, it's like, if you really are interested in capsules, you should look at this guy. <laughs> um, I, I think um, to the first thing you were saying about avant-garde and failure, um, I think one of the things that really came out for me in this um, research and actually in, um, actually I think what I was reading by you about Operation Breakthrough, um, one of Ivan's uh, pieces of writing, um, is about how, you know, a lot of these projects like um, uh, the the 1960 plan by Guy Tange or um, the Stratiform Structure Module, which is one of the projects in the book that I didn't talk about tonight, um, that you have these these initiatives that are these things, and this probably exists, you could say, with the Capsule Tower as well, that seem like failures, but if you start to break them down into, or digest them into the kind of components that or technologies, the manufacturers that went into them, you'll find that there are these parts or these systems that were actually wildly successful. And one of the things that um, uh, one of the architects um, from Kyunori Kikutake's office uh, told me about um, uh, the, the Stratiform project, actually I just want to put it up on the screen. Mm -hmm. It's a good one to see. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things Dynamic. <laughs> sorry. Um, sorry if this doesn't, if I can find this quickly, I will come back. Oh. <laughs> Right, we're almost there. Um, it's it's uh, just better to see it with with an image. Um, uh, is that, that this project, this transform structure module, um, while it was never built beyond 
one prototype that actually all the technologies for its frame, for its seismic base isolation, for its fireproofing, for the prefab housing that went into it, uh, its greening system, that all these different kinds of things that were assembled into it actually were very influential on all these different other projects. And so I think what was really interesting for me to realize is that a lot of these avant-garde projects, that their architects actually saw them as exciting stories in which you could unite many different technologies and smaller stories to make something. And so in a way, it's kind of like not about, you know, their being built or not to some degree, but really about the kinds of um, things that they provoked out of the technologies that they were able to gather together. Um, and so I think that that's made me a lot more um, kind of open, I would say, to <laughs> uh, some projects that, that you know, that it's, it's sometimes going to seem too easy to call things failures, for sure, mm. I think. Um, but I also think um, with, with uh, the, uh, I think, you know, your, your focus on, on um, off-site construction in Japan, I, I am curious about your perspective on one of the things that I spend quite a lot of time on and um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on kind of its current discussion of, of uh, the dominance of, of scrap and build in, in Japan. You just mentioned the kind of um, uh, recycling that I think Sekisui Haim is doing that I think is really kind of a model uh, company. But one of the things that I, I talk about quite a lot in the book is how there's not really this culture of renovation in Japan and that really the totally dominant uh, mode is that things are torn down and placed with new construction, uh, and how this starts to really be to be questioned, um, you know, as uh, ecology, the climate, etc., have become much more um, uh, to the fore. And one of the things that really stuck with me from the book, um, or research for it, uh, was said by um, the professor of Ono, a fellow Yoshitika Utida who's a kind of um, parametabolist, you could say, who's very important in my, my story. Um, he said when I interviewed him, you know, how many different kind of industries, housing industries in Japan, are systems for system's sake. Mm -hmm. And that idea of the system for system's sake, uh, where construction has kind of mm -hmm. become only about perpetuating itself, really in a way similar to the military industrial complex in, in the United States especially, um, is something that really kind of struck me very kind of powerfully and really kind of, I would say, altered my kind of trajectory <laughs> in the book. And I'm wondering if you kind of feel like what your kind of conversations have been around that in, in Japan. Maybe before you, no, please. you answer, I, I just want to read from page 140, uh, your comment exactly on this point uh, where you write, uh, while opportunities arose for artificial land to address problems such as unserviced sprawl, uh, it was also used to facilitate new levels of consumerism and the continuing quest for cheap land that could make sprawl worse. The metabolist concept of uh, cyclical replacement could easily legitimize the wastage of, of planned obsolescence uh, that encouraged disposing of the last season's model, further opening the rift between humans and the environment rather than closing it. And so perhaps now you have more material yeah. even to react this to. Is, I mean, this is, that's, um, it, I think you have to be, we have to sense the sensitive issue because, um, so I've, I've been in some complicated conversations at, with co different government officials about this topic, mm. both in Japan and the U.S. with translators. Um, and, you know, so I think, first of all, Japan has a culture, um, has a wood building culture that, that where, um, not just a wood building culture, but a bio-based material culture until the 20th century. Um, like the U.S. actually, except with differences, uh, where most of the world moved to uh, non-combustible materials around World War I uh, because we scared them to death with, with our advertising, by the way, uh, the right. Portland Cement Company. Uh, Japan held on to some of those traditions, and some of those traditions probably until the 1960s and 70s and this acceleration of home building. Um, I wouldn't say it was scrap and built. It, was, it wasn't disposable. It was really that certain systems lived longer than others. So they have a yeah. timber struck. The reason that you know Japanese joinery is so complicated isn't because they're architecture students and they like making their lives difficult. It's because right. of deconstructability and the value of the material in the building, right? Not just because of the, the shrines, the, the housing itself. So there's a tradition of a very 
of a metabolism, right, in Japanese construction. And you would find that in also in other traditions in Switzerland, you still find that. Uh, what happened clearly in the 70s and 80s was there was a population boom. And there was a consolidation where um, most building cultures in most in the in US and Europe and Latin America are actually fragmented. Japan is one of the few building cultures that had looks like other industries in the sense that you have a small number of large players mm -hmm. um, that like having proprietary systems. Mm -hmm. And so for the 70s and 80s, they spent a lot of effort to make sure that there was all the things we find negatively in our consumer products, right? right? But it's and, but with all of that said, for example, Ono, they bought, uh, Shiseki Sui Chemical, a large plastics company, bought Ono's, let's say, patent. That patent was designed to be a sort of self-build, potentially. They didn't build it that way for years. Right, right. Um, it, it's a light, light gauge steel frame. Now they even do a wood frame. But um, as the population started to decline, and also as the Japanese government since 2000 has made construction companies more responsible for construction waste, which we don't do in the US, by the way, right. <laughs> um, they have been forced uh, to look for business opportunity in these new regulations and in Ono's design. So now it turns out that that design, which they used for a construction efficiency, not for variability, turns out has given them Unique, you know, an economic, an economic outlet. So I think the story is more complex. Right. Um, and right. we had, we've literally had these discussions where, you know, we uh, in the U.S. we build housing that probably shouldn't live for more than 15 or 20 years. It's full of petroleum products and glues. It right. does live longer. It does, and it's impossible to recycle. It's it, it yeah. will have to be destroyed. So I'm I'm always a little sensitive of that topic because I think. Japan had that period of overbuilding and, and let's say scrapping, mm -hmm. but also is actually. Uh, um, in some ways, because of that, is, is much closer, I would say, to a solution uh, to problems we will face in the U.S. very soon and other uh, parts of the world than we are right now. Right. So I'd like to ba like the balance. Yeah. And the Japanese are very hard on themselves about that too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They they agree, you know, wholeheartedly to be critical about it. And yet, when you look at those systems, um, the, the ease with which they are able to make them more circular, to make them more metabolist, is is is, is a shock compared to the way we build, at least in the U.S. and in right. other parts of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, and do you think the uh, like the condition where you have a few, uh, very few uh, large players, mm -hmm. uh, or the Zenicon, right? The, Zen, the Japanese love to coin these terms. The Zenicon stands for general contractor. Uh, and are these conditions particular to Japan, or do we find them um, more also, you know, in other countries? In which case. Um, how does that play against the smaller players on the market? Yeah. Uh, and that probably leads on to the next question, which I, uh, which also you, you brought up uh, that that did kind of the, the question of the individualization of the of the unit mm. versus standardization, which is not easily reconciled. Always. Right. Right. Uh, so the interest of the Zenicon to standardize for efficiency sake and the the need for a society where uh, the standard of living is rising actually to individualize the unit. Uh, well, there was a perception by the Japanese government in the 50s and 60s, uh, like the housing you showed in Osaka near the project you showed, which was much more, let's say, European post-war style right. precast concrete. They assumed that, that I would call it repeatable. I think standardization means something different than we use it, but that's, that's if you want to read my dissertation, we can, standardization is actually a lot more like mass customization, and really what you're looking at is repeatable designs. They thought that was cheaper. It turns out it's not. So once these, these large conglomerates, uh, once they set up true standardization, which is a feedback loop of continual improvement like we have with our products, they found out how much people were willing to pay for customization and how much it actually cost. And really, those large companies provide entirely non-repeatable uh, products mm -hmm. with a high degree of customization, what we've been talking about in architecture for 20 years and have not been able to achieve uh, just with software. It takes mm -hmm. a little more than software. Um, so they've been delivering on a highly customizable product to the middle class who can pay for it. Right. Um, in, the sing in often single family or what we would call missing middle, probably like multi-family, multi-unit, but not really multifamily, and they've been doing that pretty successfully. So I think they, you know, it's also that industry. <clears throat> once, once you, once the industry, once the construction industry industrialized in Japan, it did consolidate. It required a large capital investment. That's why a plastics company set up a housing company. They had a cash flow. Uh, that's why Toyota got involved. Uh, and, uh, forestry, Panasonic. Yeah, and for uh, another company, Misawa is funded by forestry products company. So having that capital flow, so you can scale up and look like an industry. Uh, was a prerequisite. And then guess what? Consumers were willing to pay for more customization 
and they were and if and they found a price point where the there, there's TV show ads in in Japan for for offsite housing where it says it's only eight percent more, and it's only eight percent more because the small builder can't afford to provide that kind of customization. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, Japan had to b bail out their, their conventional contractors in the 80s and 90s because they were actually not able to compete anymore with these large conglomerates. They, the last big public housing program was funding small CAD CAM mom and pop uh, workshops in the 80s and 90s throughout rural Japan so those companies wouldn't go out of business. So even the heavy timber traditional constr you know, construction is in a way been... Um, digitized and industrialized because yeah. because of the consolidation and like there's probably eight large players that you know one that produce one in five homes in Japan which we don't have anything close to that in mm. neither in Europe or, or in the US or really anywhere yeah mm. yeah yeah I think I mean there is a lot of sophistication in Japan with these kinds of uh, technologies and, and mass customization I think though uh, one of the things I've really kind of felt like, you know, with the kind of counter kind of uh, uh, story I want to make in, in trying to move away from the, the single family house is just like how I think there's, yes, this incredible development with that in terms of prefab and, and uh, circularity in Japan. But um, of course, I feel like when I'm writing, I'm writing about Japan, but I'm also always thinking about here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, really, you know, that ties very much into my interest in, in moving away from the single family home as a, as a type. And I think that, you know, um, mass transit in Japan, the incredible railway made this kind of urban sprawl possible that is largely single family homes. And I feel like, you know, what has become very interesting to me is is, is um, kind of not the mainstream of the single family home in Japan, but um, really the kind of mainstreaming of, of skeleton mm -hmm. infill. Mm -hmm. And I didn't talk about it really in the talk, but um, it's something that's detailed in the book that the artificial land has, you could say in some ways neutered, <laughs> but uh, has become kind of corporatized mm -hmm under the name skeleton infill, which is the idea of really building apartment buildings as kind of like a core and shell office building, really, but instead of for office space for residential. And so um, I feel like that's maybe this kind of tension in Japan, but then at the same time, it's also something where I think there's like many shades between those um, things. I mean, one kind of example be the Stratiform project that is about mm. a big skeleton and, and uh, uh, off-site produced housing. Um, but I think the kind of skeleton approach to housing is um, extremely interesting to me, I think, as the kind of the other sort of uh, contemporary practice that has been in a long period of development. I mean, in a way, my book is really a history of skeleton infill in, in Japan. Um, and I think, you know, like when I see something like Eric Adams and others, you know, talking about like, you know, can we convert these office buildings to housing in New York City? It's like, okay, well, shouldn't we from now on be designing office buildings that can be residential and vice versa? You know? Or office buildings that don't have the floor plate that our office buildings in America do because architects are not involved in policy. Because in Europe, you could very easily convert an office building to housing because it, it's yeah. humane and yeah. it doesn't have a it's floor plate. It's going to be 12 meters. Have, yeah. <laughs> so, that's you it. know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of less, that, that's why there's a lot of lessons that we still haven't learned and we don't teach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, that, that brings me to one other thing that I've, I've wondered about your perspective on, um, which, you know, is also provoked by, by my research for the book, which is just how incredibly just aggressive and deep and broad Japan's openness to learning mm -hmm. from other cultures was and, and is. And I recently listened to this um, conference with an organization in New York City, who I will not name, who was um, interviewing some people from the Viennese uh, housing department. And you may know, many of you, that Vienna, I think like 90% of the population lives in social housing. And it's incredible social housing um, that like the middle class and beyond um, often live in. And, you know, this person being interviewed from the Vienna housing department and the New York interviewer was like, of course, you know, 
we can't really do what you're doing here in the US. <laughs> and I was like, no one in Japan in the 1950s or 60s would ever say that. <laughs> you know, it's like, they're gonna find the way to, to adapt it, transform it, take bits and pieces of it. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, like I've kind of gone Japan to this research and certainly my feeling now is like, I don't, despite the book, I don't see myself as, as a Japanese architecture expert, um, at least exclusively, for, for life. And I'm very interested in, in moving around and back to the US. And I, I'm wondering, you know, with all the work that you've done in Japan and the modular work you do here, do you feel that there's the openness here from the US? I know you're doing this work with HUD now. Has that been a challenge? Or do you, do you, do you still feel a lot of, I don't know, pushback? Or that there is a kind of openness to, um, uh, as Le Corbusier would say, the authorities being more open to, to these influences? Well, like next time they tell you, the next time somebody tells you there's no social housing in America, then in 1930s Germany, social housing was anything that the government subsidized uh, and secured mortgages on. Hmm. So our, you know, mortgage tax deduction is actually a socialist invention. Sorry, you know, you heard it here. Right, uh, so right. you know, Ernst Mein did that to be able to produce the housing he did in Frankfurt, which was literally called socialist or social democratic. So I think our definitions are changing. Hmm. Also, 90% of Vien Viennese housing isn't public housing or social housing in the way we define it. It's that they acknowledge that all housing is subsidized right. by the government right. as it is here. We just don't acknowledge it the same right. way. So the right. fact that we have, you know, again, the mortgage tax break for owning a single family home and sometimes a condominium, if you're lucky, um, is something that we should also acknowledge. So I think that's, yeah. I think the difference is this kind of discussions about understanding really best practices or that we are all in the same you know, we're sharing a lot of problems together right now as a society across the world is, I think, mm. what's making people more open. Yeah. Uh, but the U.S. has been very exceptionalist for many, uh, many years. We think our problems are unique uh, and we think our solutions are unique. Um, and most of the rest of the world has actually been in a dialogue. So you will find, you know, that the uh, Japanese know a lot about all kinds of places. They know more about the history of American housing than I, I learned about Operation Breakthrough in Japan. Yeah. Right. Um, so. That just tells us, I think, this kind of discussions and getting past like kind of disciplinary boundaries, geographic boundaries, and finding that a lot of people have been thinking about these things for a long time, and we need to we need all of that help. Yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> hmm. Well, maybe just a, one last question for me before we open it up. Um, especially maybe Ivan, you have experience with government agencies, uh, and probably. I guess the question is, to put it politically nicely, is whether you think there is any relationship between a specific type of government or political inclination uh, and the possibility to develop the off-site construction, especially as regards dwelling, um, or is there a connection between social dwelling development and, um, and a political agenda? Well, certainly, you know, you brought up Vienna, but you know, certainly one thing we're struggling with, uh, with, with the federal government is to understand it, at which scale should change happen, at which scale should pilot projects happen. Operation Breakthrough, with this thing that we're referencing that maybe no one else knows about, was a national program in the U.S. to increase housing affordability. Really, even in socialist countries, no one ever tried to do a national program. There were city, even the city of Moscow, you know, in the 1960s, the heart of communism, was working at a municipal scale mm -hmm. to look at these problems. So just even understanding maybe more in terms of politics scale that, you know, maybe there are places have different, uh, mm -hmm. different needs and different configurations. And what does it mean to support housing reform at a national or global scale. I mean, we even, you know, companies operate at national and global scales. Um, and then how do we start with a city like New York, which actually has had some pretty innovative uh, approaches to housing and then sometimes kind of falls off the, falls off the wagon. And how do, those, how do those internationally and even nationally, how do those scales of innovation, problems, um, re regulations and codes and, and innovators work together is, is literally what, what, what is being discussed right now. Um, mm -hmm. And Japan is pretty good at that too, by the way. They've, yeah. they've, they've yeah. figured out a way. They have a, um, even their regulatory system is kind of liberal at on the one hand, but is also very, does protect life safety and supports innovation in a way that ours does not. Um, mm -hmm. So there's right. a lot to learn from there too. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we can open this up if anyone has any, I think they want to ask our 
podcasts. Please. Hi, you um, mentioned that uh, some of the artificial land folks emphasized building on piers. And I was wondering uh, uh, whether you were aware of any projects that kind of focused more on tension structures, essentially akin to a suspension bridge or a cable stay, because presumably you could put it at a much higher level over a much broader uh, part of uh, otherwise occupied land. Um, hmm. Interesting question. I mean, um, there are tension structures in, I think, some of the unbuilt work by Kurokawa um, that were artificial land proposals. Like, um, I think one of the versions of Hewick City had a kind of tensile skeleton from a kind of mast situation. Um, but, you know, as I said, like, um, I was kind of uh, limited uh, uh, by myself to only look at, at built work, but but you know it's funny on a small scale. Um, do you know the architect Osamu Ishiyama? So Osamu Ishiyama um, is an architect uh, who studied with Yoshizaka at um, Waseda um, in the. 1970s. And so I interviewed uh, Ishiyama at his house, um, which is in Setagaya, uh, Tokyo. And his house, um, he calls an artificial land house. In some ways, it's a project that should have been in my book. Um, and his house is, uh, it, it's four masts that have uh, tension cables um, coming down from them, hanging the floors, and then going down to the ground to, to uh, uh, restrain it you know, for seismic movement. So the house has, I mean, it, it is a tension structure. It is artificial land. It is built. Um, he was there. It's also where his office is. And um, when he gave me a tour of the house, um, he told me how he was very inspired by the work of Buckminster Fuller in, in his approach to artificial land. Um, and so as Ishiyama was walking around the house giving me this tour, he kept on like doing this kind of like pantomime of like walking into the diagonals and like bumping his head and saying, tension, very good in theory, very bad in practice. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I think that there's a lot to be said for that, that there's this kind of, um, uh, I mean, it's very kind of obvious, I guess, once you know it, but you know, the, the kind of irony of tension structures that they require something very heavy and big somewhere to restrain them, usually, not always, but usually. Yeah. And, and so uh, beyond Ishiyama's house, <laughs> which is a wonderful house, I actually have some photos of it on my website where I put the interview, because the interview in its entirety did not go into the book, um, but you can see his house on my website or, or various places online, um, is the only example of artificial land I know that's built with a tension structure. So, I mean, just, you know, you think of all the suspension bridges over very valuable, in, you know, cities from, you know, New York at, to wherever. At a, at a bigger scale, at a bigger over scale. Water. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But maybe just a, a little kind of context for, to answer your question. Uh, we also know that uh, Kenzo Tange is the first kind of architect, major architect to use um, uh, suspension structures from the the engineering from uh, bridge construction in 1964, so in in the Yoyogi Stadium in yeah. uh, in Tokyo. So we assume that probably nobody has done it uh, before, and so the technology was not uh, integrated into the architectural thinking before that. Um, and some of the at least uh, Ikikutake and uh, probably uh, uh, and Kurokawa were not completely uh, comfortable with these new technologies. Uh, so, And it also took something at a national scale, like the Yogi Stadium, for the Olympics to you know, make the effort and bring these uh, new technologies into actual construction. Uh, the other thing I would say is that, um, that the, the idea of, um, of a space frame uh, was 
at some point uh, kind of contradictory to using uh, cables. Mm. And if you think about uh, the, the Polish engineer uh, Makowski in uh, London who was developing um, uh, these uh, space, uh, space frames, as opposed to, for example, Larry Collet, who was working here at the archives and who was completely against these uh, space frames uh, because he said there's a lot of waste of material. So all the members, even those that take only tension and not compression, are, are dimensioned in the same way. Uh, but the metabolist had a strong inclination towards the, the space frames, uh, partly because they were standardized and offered the modulation uh, that went well with the idea of a future development and taking off certain elements and adding. So uh, tensions you know, could have come in uh, probably, but uh, it didn't for some probably prejudice or you know, lack of development of that uh, of those structures, I think. I think, Lu I think, Lewis, I think Lewis Mumford, mm -hmm. Lewis Mumford uh, published some pretty crazy projects in an art, in an art show record of 1930 where he compares a uh, single family house by Buckminster Fuller, you would like this actually, and critiques how single family houses will never be a solution to housing uh, mm -hmm. shortage and actually has a unbuilt uh, German, mm -hmm. uh, I'd never heard of the architects before, but essentially a tensile cable. Uh, well, the, like the Bucky, the 40 house by Bob was, Buckminster Fuller actually. Yeah, but these, were, these were essentially like multi-story. Yeah. And, and interesting enough, again, uh, Mumford published this, but sort of disappeared in history. And Bucky had a better PR machine, I guess. Um, but, you know, kind of co counter counterposed Bucky's proposal with a tensile cables, mm -hmm. uh, artificial land proposal from somewhere in Germany. I don't remember the name of the architects. Mm -hmm. um, with these giant, you know, masts. Uh, and, mm -hmm. um, and this idea that at a certain scale, um, it really would function as a kind of flexible, almost plate. Uh, I can I can dig it up. It's it, it, it made me think of it when you were describing, you know, a bridge that <laughs> it looks like a giant bridge in that way. Yeah. But for Mum Mumford's point was, and he did some interesting calculations. He's critiquing Bucky for saying, you know, um, the the efficiency or the economy, if we're really interested in housing people, is not going to be in the single family home, no matter how right. uh, technologically sophisticated it is. It's simply, uh, it's simply not going to address. Um, and he actually had some pie charts and did some cost calculations, uh, which you don't always see in a, mm -hmm. in a, in a Mumford uh, text, to right. just show how much money was being spent in structure as a, in, in a single family house versus any multifamily dwelling. Mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. So just linking those two comments right, together. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the one other project I just remember when you mentioned Kikutake is, is it's not artificial land. Per se, but but tension in a metabolist project um, that's built is the the hotel um, Tokuen by uh, uh, Kikutake, mm -hmm. which uses a kind of like big uh, beam, which then floors are suspended from, but but not a kind of bridge structure uh, so much. Um, just a a couple um, thoughts as you all have been talking. Um, one is that. Um, I've been looking at kind of like the codification of Japanese gardens from over a thousand years ago. Um, and I've also in the past sort of studied about modulization in Japan um, historically. So it, it makes sense to me that that would have been carried over into the 20th century and into now. Um, and the other thing um, just having traveled in Japan and I lived there for a bit, um, many people that I knew at that time when I was living there um, really were against this notion of um, once they dwelled in their house, right, no then that's the end of that, ha that dwelling's life, yeah. right? Yeah. And so this whole Soiled. notion of adaptive <laughs> reuse or uh, certainly adaptive reuse for a new family or a new group of people is is something that um, isn't really culturally acceptable from mm. what I understand. And certainly traveling through the landscape there or traveling even through cities like Osaka, Nagasaki, Sapporo, you see abandoned dwellings all around, right? Yeah. On the smaller scale, right? Single family yeah. house or, or duplex or, or, you know, maybe a couple stories. Um, so certainly we see that also in some multifamily housing yep. where, you know, part of the overall superstructure, part of, half of it may be inhabited and the other half is just kind of, um, 
the, the maybe fam the family still own it, but it's sort of like not really maintained. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, there there's a very high level of of abandonment in in Japan. I mean, there. I mean, as has come up a couple times. I think just with the the population uh, shrinkage, um, that that there's a lot of abandonment. Um, there's actually a new book that just came out this year of the photograph not only the abandoned structures of Japan. Japan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but even in I guess I'm I'm saying yes, yeah, certainly in in more thinly settled areas, my right more rural zones, mm -hmm. that's very apparent moving right. around the landscape. But even right. in cities, yeah, right, where younger people are still moving to, we see that. So it's mm -hmm. kind of this interesting thing of like culturally, right? You wouldn't per se. Um, move into something that was used. Right, right. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the used um, uh, explanation is one that I think you come across a lot. I mean, I certainly came across it a lot as like an explanation of why, say, scrap and build happens, because like nobody wants to live in this house that somebody lived in before. But um, I, have the feeling that, and this is going out a bit on a whim, I think that that might be more of a construction that's post-war and built on advertising than much else. Because I think if you look at historical systems like the one that I write about in the book, um, which is a, a particular tatami system that was prevalent in Osaka, the, the Kyoma tatami system, that was, you know, used from like the late Edo period till mm -hmm. up until World War II. It had a vast network of shops that were about refurbishing tatami mats to resell. Yeah. And so, you know, you had a huge rental population at the time. I mean, most of Japan was a rental Market. population um, before uh, uh, World War II. Mm -hmm. um, that's where we change. And so, you know, I think. I'm, I'm a bit suspicious of that being culturally, you know, the way J Japan is, because I think, and this is another kind of um, um, hunch that I, I haven't verified, um, but I think that part of the issue with scrap and build too, I, I suspect, is connected to depreciation rates that are, are made for architecture. And those, those depreciation rates from accountants those are constructs that are in the interest of the construction industry. And, you know, I was talking, we've been talking about the influence of um, models uh, taken from elsewhere. And, you know, the 30 year mortgage was a huge thing in Japan. Um, actually, Yoshizaka's house was, um, I didn't quite say this, about tapping into the 30 year mortgage that you could get in Japan from the Government Housing Loan Corporation if you had a piece of land. So he wanted to make artificial land. And he fills this concrete. Yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. that would be fireproof. Um, and so, you know, you see that, that the Japanese are looking at um, like New Deal uh, loan programs in the United States to make their own 30-year mortgage after World War II. And I think similarly in the United States, you had um, practices that were codified for depreciation rates for office buildings that led to office buildings being able to be written off as an expense after like 15 years, which is incidentally the number of years that we were told Japanese houses are obsolete by. And then you could tear down the office building and build a new one. And this was loved by people in the construction industry and, and others. And so I, I, I have, it's not something that I've, I know, but I have the strong hunch that there's a similar practice in accounting in, in Japan. And I think, you know, similarly with, with um, so many things in the U.S. that is very good at advertising. You know, the the housing market in Japan spends enormous sums on advertising. You go into the subway and there's advertising for house manufacturers. So I feel like that's a kind of um, construction. Is is my sense? I'm not mm. I'm not going to stand behind that absolutely, but that's my suspicion. So I've done a little bit of research on this. Oh, <laughs> here we go. Here we go. And so, and first of all, so again. I think I always get cautious because I think, the, again, the, there's, there is a certain culture in Japan about building and rebuilding, and we know that, they used, that the, the capital would move when the emperor died, 
right. because it was uh, it, there's a certain geomancy associated with that that's also pra practiced in Korea that a death or a negative experience has an impact on land. So, it you know what happened to that family? Why did they move out? It may be the cultural norm as opposed to that all mm -hmm. things are disposable. Certainly, that's right. not Japanese culture. It is I mean, um, so there's a there's some cultural background, um, but also the Japanese um, Japanese government very consciously, if you look at the loan program, and this we do know, is they were very worried about fires and earthquakes, and they didn't know how to upgrade existing right. building stock. So essentially they, and they didn't do urban renewal the, to the level that the US did, or even European cities. What they did do was to try to nudge people out of so what they saw as sub substandard combustible housing in the 50s and 60s yeah. through this mortgage program. Um, and that mortgage program inadvent inadvertently actually benefited really more like H steel than concrete because well, the, the projects you're looking at are super interesting. They're a small percentage of housing. Really, right. the big change in Japan was because of the Korean War and because we used Japan to fight the Korean War. And well, we set up, essentially, the GM plants that we set up to win World War II in Japan had a lot of light gauge steel. That light gauge steel was being used in a lot of low to mid-rise construction. It was seen as a, as a way to move people out of substandard housing. Um, because they didn't actually, uh, they they just the government was really worried that they would actually these buildings would fall down in a in a, in a seismic event they would burn down, right. and that was where it came from. But interestingly enough, in the last twenty years, it's the offsite industry that has uh, encouraged essentially they haven't. There's two trade associations that re represent the offsite industry. One of them is just to encourage the the real estate appraisal of of offsite buildings as not losing value, which has inadvertently led to rehab. Right. They did right. it for very selfish reasons. Their, their, their buildings are so an offsite building made in a factory because it's certifiable now actually is the only kind of building that appreciates or at least right. maintains its value. All other buildings actually decrease in value, partly because of, again, this mortgage system, which had a nice idea and then people forget why they did it. Um, but it, because those now they did it to, to sell their buildings for only 8% more, but in, inadvertently also produced a, a, a climate now where all of these companies now provide uh, refurbishing services right. because the population isn't growing. So again, I, I just always get worried. It's I always feel like we're, sometimes people are trying to dismiss uh, building culture in Japan because it's so good that we need to find some problems with it. Right. Where in fact, it is that good. That, that is the closest thing we have to a economically viable circular economy at a large scale that you mm -hmm. can see, where companies right. are making money doing what we should be doing, which is recycling buildings. So it, it's whatever happened with scrap building, there's reasons for it. I always get worried about it because really the, 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 the shift in Japan in the last 20 years is unbelievable. We are nowhere near that. And even, Europe, even the European Union has pushed for carbon targets in terms of construction. There's still not the accountability to construction waste or building performance that Japan has. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. they might maybe it's because they had a bad experience with scrap and build. Right. Maybe it's because I think it's actually because of the same thing that re let the scrap and build, which is yeah. that there's an awareness of metabolism in right. building and it can you can it can be that knowledge can be used for good or evil. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, yeah, like yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's um, just it's to great continue point. on this. If you, uh, it's certainly, uh, I believe, it's it's certainly not a cultural um, kind of uh, tendency uh, to scrap and uh, you know uh, because and actually, it's, uh, there's this book. Uh, it's a series of books by A.S.K. Shikawa, uh, which we actually own. It's pen uh, and that that writes a uh, whole thing about the period where Japan was closed off to the world, the Edo period. Uh, and it's a series of books on ecology in Japan, the cir circular economy in Japan, recycling in Japan. Each book is one of these. So it certainly shows you that it was very much ingrained in, in the, the general Culture. approach to, uh, to housing, but to all things material, uh, basically. Uh, but what I suspect happened throughout the 20th century, and that's actually a point that Peter and Alison Smithson are making, they write this text called, But Today We Collect Ads. Mm -hmm. And that's a text that basically says every generation arrived to Japan and every generation looked at Japan differently through the eyes of the, the period. And by the 1950s, uh, Japan was about, you know, advertising, but also the piece of paper flying in the street and all the consumer, the disposables. So I think it's a question also of the rise of the, the consumer economy in Japan uh, and the change of a culture uh, as the political circumstances and the economy flourished, basically, uh, so it's it could you know return again, and because Japan obviously its economy has been declining in in the past it's few flatlining. years, flatlining. It's literally flatlining. <laughs>
then it's that consumer. Then it's everywhere still, right? And so regardless of what the data sets say, experiencing city life or town life there is all about consumerism and, uh, and, and commerce, similar, I think, to you know, what you're citing. So I, hmm. I mean, part of what I'm doing now is like, there's all of the texts and the things that we can study and read, but then there's also the experiential of being there and moving the landscape there or the landscape or whatever, and thinking about what kind of public realm is created in uh, you know, these areas where there's maybe recycled housing going on or removal of interventions, and, and what is that mean? Place space now. Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, absolutely. I'm just saying, you know, it changes over time. And I think uh, you can read um, Kengakuma, a prominent architect today, which I happen to investigate in my PhD, um, also writes a text about the radical change that happened in the way we think of architecture around 1995 uh, with the burst of the economic bubble mm -hmm. and the kind of commissions that were no longer available for architects and therefore how they changed their approach to architecture, the way they use materials, the way you know they even think of what the building demonstrates or shows out uh, on the exterior. And of course, the relationship to industry. Uh, a lot of the work that these architects got in the 1980s uh, was no longer available for them. Uh, so there was a change. And perhaps you know we're not returning to the Edo period, uh, nor should we, possibly. Uh, but uh, there is, I think it's important to see that within the context, compare it to previous periods. And whenever there's an economic uh, kind of shift, mm -hmm. Uh, something in thinking has uh, changed. Okay, I think Andy, you had a question. I was ask, um, well, so I was kind of interested in you uh, to kind of raise one is on the ground about the team one's team ten. I was interested in is there any like basic difference besides from the form and the size of the project, such as uh, like design attitude towards like human uh, and technology, for example. So it's kind of based on technology that's driving a lot of design intent. So is there any effect on T10 Um Sure. I mean, I think the main distinction there, I mean, first of all, um, uh, Kijo Kurokawa did actually go to one of the Team 10 meetings. <laughs> so it's not that there's an absolute distinction between archigram metabolism and a Team 10 one, or that they saw themselves that way. So it really is um, a, a um, comparison from Hajime Atsuka that should not be seen in any kind of absolute terms, but I think is very helpful um, when we think about different um, directions within metabolism. But but I, I would say, you know, on the Team 10 side, um, what I think you really see, um, say, if you look at, at Masato Otaka, um, is that he is, like Team 10 Architects, very interested in looking at vernacular architectures and thinking about how to use them in, a, in an authentic, contemporary way, but then also looking at modern architecture and thinking, how does this modern you know, idea, form, structure, system, whatever, Become something that that can become a kind of type that 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 has the kind of durability of a vernacular. So I feel like there's that relationship always in um, Team Ten, or at least the Team Ten work that I think is the strongest. That is about this relationship to tradition and history, but also really working with modern um, sensibilities of of to to combine. And I think that that's what. That's the metabolist work that I, I like the most, and that that is not doing it in a superficial way. But I find like that drawing that I showed of the um, the red grid drawing by by Otaka. I, I love that drawing. Mm. It's very it's a basic drawing, but just you just see like this guy is using a wood module for the design of a steel frame high rise. I mean, and it's not just this kind of nostalgic thing, but again, is, is actually connecting to the people who are making the shoji screens and fusuma that are actually the infill of the apartment. Um, so I would say, you know, that's a bit more of a kind of unpacking of that, but, but that's not an absolute 
you know, kind of thing, or that again, they kind of saw themselves that way. Um, yeah. It's a really profound, it's, it's a very useful and simple and useful concept. Also, even in the simple yeah. sense that, you know, team, I mean, what we call in the US brutalism is also probably more of an archogram than a Team 10. Uh, like Paul Rudolph is someone who thought about how his buildings would look in pop culture. Uh, and, you know, and the Smithsons very or very obsessed about not having buildings that were easily photographable. Um, and so there's, and, you know, the Smithsons were not as interested in technology. They were interested in, if you ever look at the, their, their retirement house, they were planning on building what never did because architects don't retire. They were obsessed with actually using materials, not just material, material systems that reflected the scarcity of post-war Britain. And so there's, I think it's a really, um, it's a really important, it's a really yeah. important distinction. And Archigram, you know, they all, they all had day jobs in uh, kind of council pl uh, state planning and they were really angry with the welfare state and were really into pop culture and their, so it, you know, even their, they, they, their experiences in daily life and what they saw as a liberation, they were actually really interested in consumerism in a way that the Smithsons, whether it was old fashioned or contemporary in today's perspective, were pretty critical of. Um, and so I, I, and I think it's, it's a yeah. simple but useful concept that, that, that distinguishes what seemed like at times to be, you know, conceptually there's a lot of overlap, but actually yeah. it's quite different and ideologically sometimes even opposed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are going to have to wrap up, so maybe, do you have any kind of last comments? You don't have to. I think I've said enough. All right. <laughs> so I'd like to really... Uh, but, but I'd like to thank Ivan. Yeah. I, I would like to say one thing in this project that um, has been really great is that I, I have I have cold called and cold emailed many, many people over the length of this project um, who have responded very positively, been super helpful. And I, I just cold emailed. Um, Ivan, you know, some months ago, because I had just seen a number of things and read a number of things by him, and I thought I really like his perspective, and here he is today. So, it's just that good. <laughs> so get 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 your copy. <laughs> so a big thank you, Ivan, for coming all the way and for your contribution to this. Okay. And please also look at Ivan's work. You can find it on YouTube and uh, online. And thank you, Casey, for enlightening us and adding a really important uh, chapter to our understanding of this period, but also making this um, relevant again for our students and for practice. So I would like to first, let's thank them. Thank you. And I invite you to join us uh, for a reception in the upper gallery. And there is also uh, books for you if you would like to have to take a copy home uh, using Venmo <laughs> here. Um, thank you very much for coming and uh, have thank a great you. evening.